My mom and dad lived on a small farm. They were tenant farmers between Kansas and Paris, Illinois, and went to Pleasant Hill Christian Church. And many of you parents probably have in time, over time, given your children Cheerios to snack on or something just to keep them occupied and quiet during church. For some reason, my mom gave me celery. You know what that does in the middle of a sermon? You hear this crunch, you know, this kid with no teeth yanking down on a piece of celery and gnawing on it. I've been in church almost all my days from my infancy. I've been to Bible college. I've been in ministry. And yet I am still learning as the Spirit teaches me. May I never, until I see Him face to face and I'm like Him, may I never assume I've got it figured out. There is always growth. There is always learning to be had in our Christian discipleship. Always. Are you teachable? Are you a Timothy to a Paul? And can you pour into others? It doesn't mean you have to teach formally. It can be very informal, but can you pour into the life of another? You, a Paul, to their being Timothy. One of the things that has boggled my mind over the years with the, with the rise of social media, social media can be downright ugly, can't it? And a lot of times I encourage people, just turn it off and be done with it. But one blessing that has come from it is this, a reconnecting with people that I haven't seen in years, in decades, literally. And I've had people from my youth ministry right down the road at Highview Christian Church in Washington, Illinois, to my first preaching post in Logansport, Indiana, and other people that I've not seen or heard of for, well, let's just be honest, 40 years, <laughs> who have connected with me on social media and said things like, I am so appreciative of what you did, of what you said, of how you impacted my life all those years ago. And my response is, and honestly, a, a truthful one and a humble one, I tend to go, what? what? What I do? What I say? I, huh? Me? And here's what I would tell you folks. You are influencing the lives of other people, whether you know it or not. Now that you know that, make sure that your influence is positive with the gospel of Christ. That the impact that you make is an eternal one to the glory of God. Not a negative one. And Barnabas. We all need a Barnabas in our lives. Now someone here will surely know in the book of Acts when we first meet Barnabas, he sold a piece of property and brought the proceeds, kind of like what Rich talked about earlier in the offering time, and we're told what his name means. What does Barnabas mean? Son of encouragement. Barnabas means son of encouragement. What a wonderful nickname. Wouldn't you like to be known as an encourager? You know, our world has enough negativity, doesn't it? And I'll be honest, there are people who just suck the life out of you, Let's, right? It's the kind of person that your phone rings and their name comes up on the screen and you go, oh, nuts. I really don't want to answer this because whether it's a 30-minute call or a three-minute call, I am going to be absolutely exhausted when it's done. Ever talk to someone like that? But there are also people when their name pops up on your phone, it's like a sweet, sweet gift from God. You just go, oh yeah, hey, how you doing? Because you know whether it's three minutes or 30 minutes when you hang up, they are going to have breathed life into you. Barnabas breathes life into people. He's the son of encouragement. He's not a life sucker, he's a life giver. We need a Barnabas in our life. And if you think about it, through the book of Acts, we have three pictures of Barnabas being an encourager. The first one is in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. 
Saul, the persecutor of the church, has gone to Damascus and on his way has encountered the risen Christ. He's Listen to the teaching of Ananias. He's been baptized into Christ. And now he, is, he, he spent some time receiving from Christ, we're told in Galatians, receiving the gospel. And now he goes to Jerusalem. But the Jerusalem church is hesitant to welcome him. They know too much about his history. And Barnabas steps in. Listen to the words. This is chapter 9, verses 26 to 28. When Saul, and we know him as Paul, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him, brought him to the apostles, and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had taught to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he, Paul, was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas was an advocate. Here is Paul, still known as Saul at that time, but here's Paul, and he's got a newfound faith. He has encountered Jesus. He wants to be a part of the church. He wants to do ministry to the glory of God. And the church is going, we don't trust you. We know your history. Anybody here have a past? Anybody here ever been seen by well-meaning, God-fearing people and kind of looked at like, mm, not sure about you. It's kind of what's happened to good old Paul. And Barnabas, notice, he takes hold of him. I don't know if he physically grabbed him, but he said, hey, come with me. I'll run interference for you. And he takes him amongst the leaders of the Jerusalem church, the apostles, the elders of the church. And Barnabas speaks up and he says, let me tell you what's transpired in this man's life. And when Barnabas has done so, as he stood as the advocate, they embrace Paul. They welcome Paul into the fellowship. And all of a sudden, he becomes this great evangelist in the city of Jerusalem. Can you imagine if Barnabas had not been an advocate for Paul? No, I'm not one to think that the, God, that the Lord's purposes can be thwarted, okay? Please don't hear me say that. I don't believe that the Lord's purposes can be thwarted. But if it hadn't been Paul, can you imagine the last half of the book of Acts wouldn't be there? Many of the books of the New Testament would not have been written. What have we have done without a Paul? God, a, God would have had to raise up someone else, a Norman. Or Brian, or Christopher. Eh. <laughs> and I'm sure God would have. But think of Paul because of Barnabas. Do you have a Barnabas in your life? Hope so. If you go over just two chapters to chapter 11, we find another situation. Life seems to have settled. We find that Paul has moved back to his ancestral home of Tarsus. Barnabas is in Jerusalem. But a church has begun in Antioch. Antioch's a little bit north of Israel. And this church is comprised of Jews and Gentiles alike. And the, the Jerusalem church says we need to send a, a representative to go and just check on things there in Antioch. What's going on? Is this God honoring? And guess who they send? They send Barnabas. Couldn't have been a better choice. And when Barnabas gets there, he decides there's work to be done and we need someone to do it. And guess whose name comes to mind? Paul's. So in Acts chapter 11, verses 22 and following, we read these words. The news about the church in Antioch reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and he witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and he began to encourage them. Oh, so surprising, encouragement from the son of encouragement. He began to encourage them with all resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, 
full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And if you go to chapter 13, which we're not going to read, you'll find that the Holy Spirit impacts and impresses upon the leaders of the church in Antioch to send Barnabas and Paul out on a missionary journey. And the missionary endeavors of the church begins in Acts chapter 13. What if Barnabas had not said, I'm going to go to Tarsus and find Paul? And there was no social media and there were no yellow pages. All right? He had to go. And he goes, okay, well, Paul's a tent maker. Yeah, I can probably find him down in the marketplace for a while. We'll go walk through with the leather makers and leather workers and see if we can find him. And at some point he bumps into him and he says, hey, we've got God's stuff to do. We're going to Antioch. And Paul said, okay. And what a difference is made. Again, I think missionary work would have gone on without Paul, but God had chosen Paul for a particular purpose. And Barnabas becomes a part of that becoming a reality. Do you have a Barnabas in your life? who will come to you and say, hey, I know you're busy making tents, but I think you ought to be busy making disciples. Come with me. You have a Barnabas to do that in your life? Well, there's another time. And this is an interesting one to me. When we turn over to Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas have done their missionary journey. They've come back to Antioch. Everybody's excited. Things are good. And if you remember, on that first journey, there had been a third person with them, a young man by the name of John Mark. And we don't know if John got physically sick traveling on the Mediterranean or whether he had gotten homesick and just needed mom's cooking or if something else had transpired. But he leaves Paul and Barnabas and he goes home. Now Paul is ready to go out a second time. This is in Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord. Let's go see how they are. And Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them in the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord." That has to have been a pretty intense disagreement. When you look back on the history between Paul and Barnabas, how encouraging the one had been, how blessed the other had been, how they had partnered in the work, and yet now a rift arises between them. Just so you know, it ultimately will be healed. But in this moment, a rift rises between them over a young man by the name of John Mark. Barnabas says, Hey, I know he didn't pan out really well first time around, but let's give him a second chance. And Paul says, you got to be nuts. I have work to do. I have God's work to do. I have kingdom work to do. I can't be taking care of this kid's diapers. And Barnabas says, oh, come on, Paul. Don't be so harsh. And Paul says, oh, come on, Barnabas. Don't be so soft. And they part ways. Paul takes Silas and continues on in one direction. Barnabas takes Mark and continues on the other. Have you ever read your New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I wonder what it would be like without those 16 chapters that we call the Gospel of Mark. If Barnabas had not been such an encourager that he said, Hey, I believe in second chances. Yeah, Kelly, you messed up once, man. But man, it, it's okay. God forgives and God makes good. Let's give it another go. But you have to leave that mask behind. If you can't tell, he's wearing a Kansas City Chiefs mask. And then 
I just, uh, if you don't know, my wife's from Buffalo, and so we're Bills fans, and today Buffalo shall prevail. That's, no, <laughs> there's going to be a throwdown between the Hollies and the Neenheisers, I just know it. <laughs> we'll see who comes battered and bruised next week. Can you imagine if John Mark had not been given a second chance by someone who encourages like Barnabas? Let me ask you, do you have a Barnabas in your life? And I'm talking Christian men and women, okay? Because, like I said, friendships are good, but the brotherhood and sisterhood of those who are partners on the path of discipleship is what we're talking about. Men and women who help us grow in Christ, stay close to Christ, and ultimately be united with Christ. Well, those are the three guys. I encourage you, regardless of your age, have a Paul in your life. Even if you have to seek someone out, <laughs> ask someone to be a Paul, or ladies, a Paulina, I guess. Because I do suggest that in nice, tight, mentoring relationships, it be men with men and women with women. And I think Paul would advocate that too when he writes to Timothy. But do you have someone in your life who can mentor you? If not, find one. And do you have someone in your life that you can be a Paul to? Can you help them grow? in their faith, so that when they look back and someone says, who's impacted your life for Jesus? They'll mention you by name. Have a Timothy. And have a Barnabas. And even if you, by personality, are one of those kinds of people who when you call my phone, I go, I really don't want to answer this, do your best to be a Barnabas. It might not run smoothly with your personality and your DNA, but do your best. Choose your words carefully and seek to encourage others, even as the son of encouragement encouraged the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. So we're going to sing a song. And this is an opportunity, if you do not know Jesus... And I know I've not talked much about gospel except that we're to impact people with the gospel. But if for some reason Scripture has been bearing down upon your heart and the Holy Spirit has been convicting you and you're saying, I want Jesus, now is the time to make a public declaration as we sing. But the vast majority is of, of us who sit here today, we've followed Jesus for some time. I just encourage you, look for and be a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. Would you stand as we sing?
You may be seated and Rich will lead us before the Lord's Supper. Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And in a couple of minutes here, we'll uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. So if you just get prepared, and then we'll all take it together. Uh, this wasn't part of my uh, meditation, but uh, it's a reflection on what Bill said today on, on mentoring. Uh, just uh, keep in mind, we, we all have some good things, and we all have failures. And uh, I like to think that sometimes you can even find good in a failure, learn from it. But uh, like I've told my kids over the years, one good thing you can say about your dad is that uh, you can always use him for a bad example. Um, without faith, we cannot know the God of love, and without hope, Faith can't endure until we meet him face to face. And the reason that the Bible says that love is greater than faith is hope is that without love, there is no redemption. And uh, without love, God the Father would not have demonstrated his supreme act of sacrificial love of, of sending his son to die on the cross for our sins. And without love, the Christian faith would not uh, have any hope on which to stand. Really, without love, nothing else matters. I came across an article uh, this week dealing with, with the chaos and unrest in the nation and the world today, and it was talking about the nation unraveling at the seams, and now actions are speaking a lot louder than words. And uh, there's just a climate of, of hatred and revenge, not one of faith, hope, and love. The world may be going crazy, but we don't have to go crazy with it. We're charged with taking the transforming power of, of love to a, a world that's desperate for it. And we've got two choices. We can slip into the despair and the unrest and maybe even panic of the world, or we can uh, take the gospel of love and peace and share it with the world. Carry the light that has the power to save the gospel of, of love and peace. And we uh, nurture the hope that God's given within each one of us, and like I have to Honestly, I have to remind myself on a pretty regular basis, and, and I remind my family and friends and others that always remember G squared T. God's got this. And if hope can shine in the darkness of Calvary, it can shine anywhere. Hope can uh, be resting solidly on, on the life, death, and, and resurrection of, of Jesus. So, this time we'll, we'll unite in, in sharing the, the Lord's Supper. Sharing his bread that represents his body that he shed on the cross. And the fruit of the vine that represents his blood that he shed. you pray with me, please. Dear God, we just thank you so much for, for showing us that your forgiveness and your unconditional love when you sent Christ to die on the cross for, for our sins. And we just ask you to help us focus on your hope so that our faith can endure until we meet you face to face. 
also help us unite in fellowship with you as, as we celebrate this time. And, and uh, we just ask you to please accept our, our thanks and, and we give you all the praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you were able to join us both in person and online. Just as a reminder, please stay in your um, pews until you are dismissed. Please do not congregate in the foyer. Um, I know that that's really hard to do, especially because it's not like you can go outside right now. But please just be mindful of people and their space and that the fact that they may not want you in their space. So just be mindful of that. And would you please stand and sing with us?